ladies who have touched it. Guys, sir, you can start. Good morning, everyone. The next talk is going to be given by Dr. Prashant Sonan from Queensland University of Technology, Australia. So he is going to talk on organic transistor, conjugated material design and evaluation. So let me just introduce briefly about the speaker. So Dr. Prashant Sona obtained a PhD in 2004 from Germany, and then he did his postdoctoral research in ETH Zurich. So after that, he joined Queensland University of Technology. Now currently, he's an associate professor at Queensland University in the School of Chemistry and Physics. And there he has established the organic and printed electronics research group so currently, Prasant Sonar is interested in designing and synthesis of novel functional materials for printed electronics, bioelectronics, and supramolecular electronic application. So to his credit, he has authored and co-authored more than 133 peer-reviewed research papers in international journals and filed 11 patents, both regionally and internationally. I welcome Dr. Prasant to take over this session. Thank you. Just give a minute. Uh, I'm just trying to find out, uh, uh, you know. I think word is not looking out. Sorry, I just need to, because I made a, some sort of a number of slides. So I just need to make sure that I'm opening the correct one. So can you see it now? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon here in Australia. So it's my great pleasure to uh, kind of uh, deliver this uh, uh, keynote talk uh, on this wonderful virtual conference. So we are all, all going through this uh, COVID situation and hope, I mean, this virtual way is also kind of making a lot of exciting things like still, I mean, we are working on a lot of exciting uh, outcome in a way of interacting the science and, you know, Kind of you know discussing the science, which is really uh, uh, we, are, we I'm really thankful to the VIT for organizing this. So today I'm going to talk about the organic transistors and uh, how these uh, organic transistors are important technology for future flexible and printed electronics, and it is also moving towards wearable and stretchable electronics. So uh, just want to give a quick uh, snapshot about Australia. The Brisbane city is located on a on a, a eastern part, uh, northeast uh, we can say. And this is our university campus having a Brisbane River and our two campuses are located. So my most of the activities are happening in a Garden Point campus. And uh, my group here in uh, Australia is working on uh, molecular material that could be either polymeric or small molecule. And we are uh, kind of trying to utilize this material for various uh, kind of uh, applications, uh, including displays. Uh, then we are also looking some sort of uh, other applications uh, such as a uh, transistors and uh, I mean uh, also like OPV in perovskite and biosensor photodetectors. And I mean we usually take the small molecule, I mean the dye pigments and then we convert them to the functional materials and we studied the self-assembly papa stacking and how we can uh, kind of uh, you know enhance the properties of this material by molecular engineering that is really the main driving force. And we do slightly also device engineering aspect, uh, looking at the interfaces and all, and how we can, by combining these two aspects, how we can kind of, you know, make the high performance uh, materials and, and devices. So this is like some sort of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, current as well as future perspective of the organic semiconductor based electronics. And uh, you can see that uh, this technology has a huge potential and you might have noticed that OLED based uh, screens are already, TVs are there. We do have a smart watches from Samsung and LG. And now it is moving towards a lot of different exciting research areas, such as a biodegradable electronics because of the electronic waste problem. Then stretchable electronics, like this is again, uh, some sort of a useful for the wearable where we can have uh, these electronic patches on a body to identify uh, you know, certain parameters of body functions. And uh, solid state lighting, because for all these OLED TVs or display market requires a transistor to run. So uh, until unless we don't have an organic based transistor, uh, it is very hard to make them flexible because using the rigid transistor again, uh, there are some limitations. So 
flexible organic transistor with a flexible OLED together as a combined technology, we can make the flexible devices. And there is a lot of, I mean, other interesting areas like a solar cell that could be, uh, I mean, organic or perovskite as well as rollable display, cell filling that is also another upcoming up. So I, I think it is an integration of the organic semiconductors together with a lot of other interesting areas. And uh, that could be also related with, uh, I mean, flexible circuit or might be smart contact lenses and all those type of things. And it is a huge market, 74 billion by 2030. And uh, I mean, looking at particularly in today's lecture, I'm going to talk about organic transistor. Uh, and it is a particularly in, uh, in transistor area, there is like some sort of a different applications and depending on type of application, we can kind of design the materials. So looking at the transistor, uh, it can be useful for uh, memory devices, it can be for a kind of a light emitting transistor where we can have a light emission in a channel semiconductor, then they can be acts as a circuit for electronic paper or RFID card or logic circuit if you want a P-type and N-type transistor together combining to make a logic circuit. And usually the transistor uh, 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 operates based on, I mean, once you apply the gate voltage between source and drain, you generate the channel conductance. It is basically like a uh, some sort of a switch uh, and then switch gets controlled by gate uh, bias and depending on gate bias we can have a, either p-type uh, holes as a majority charge carrier or electron as a majority charge carrier and at same time we can also try to have ambipolar it means that the same device can inject and transport both holes and electrons simultaneously and there is a different device geometry people uh, utilize usually most of my work uh, today I'm going to present based on the silicon silicon dioxide, uh, which is a commercially available, and then we do some uh, SAM treatment, self-assembled monolayer treatment, then putting our organic semiconductor, and then on top of that, putting the source drain as a gold electrode, we can complete the transistor fabrication, and then we, we can evaluate the electrical performance. There are other ways also, like people can take a glass substrate, and then, I mean, you know, it can be a top gate, bottom contact type of, uh, and there are multiple different device geometry one can play with. So what is the important in a transistor? You should have a material which has a high mobility. Uh, second is it should have a low threshold voltage. That is really very important to operate the transistor. We do not want to kind of apply extremely high voltages. And then on-off ratio should be high because uh, once you switch off the device, there should not be leakage current because it is a switch. And a switch, once you switch off means there is a no action. So it has a, that is the reason why on-off ratio should be high. And th this is one of the major problem in case of a 2D or other type of material, even in a graphene, the on-off ratio values are very lousy. They are extremely high mobility materials, but once you off it, still the charges are kind of, you know, conducting because of might be their uh, band gap nature and all. But where is in a, a organic material, we can really tune this band gap by changing their homolumo values or energy levels. And then we can control this P-type and type of ambipolar. And looking at uh, transistor as a different type of application, sensor is a big uh, sen uh, platform area. And where we can uh, uh, expose this uh, transistor to the gas, then it is a gas sensor, then it could be a liquid analyte. Uh, it can be a pressure sensor for artificial skin application and all that type of, even you can expose that sensor to the light and then you can have a, some sort of a photo detection. So photo transistor is another interesting area. I mentioned to you the light emitting transistor where you are injecting holes and electrons together and then we are getting the emission of light, which is a rather uh, complex uh, type of application because usually the materials and device geometry need to be a, a kind of, you know, taken into an account. And then the memory devices where the charges can be uh, stored and then uh, you know, we can read and uh, uh, write uh, kind of activities as, as a memory element and they can be flexible. And all these, if we can fabricate either on a rigid silicon, silicon dioxide, or might be on a, a type of a flexible plastic, which has a pre-pattern electrode, then we can make the flexible transistor. So this uh, important thing is like the active uh, material design, as well as the device engineering, uh, I mean, particularly in sensing, sensing element, feasibility, and type of application we are heading. And in transistor, there are sub uh, three categories. I mean, you might have noticed in a, a organic transistor, there are other type of uh, sub uh, transistor, which means that what I have mentioned you just now, which is a mainly the organic field effect transistor. It means that we are con uh, kind of, uh, you know, generating this conductance across the channel, which is the action, nothing but uh, due to the 
kind of semiconductor dielectric interface electrostatic charge built up when you apply the gate voltage under the gate bias and this is how we get organic field effect transistor but there are other uh, two subtypes uh, which are very important for biosensing and biological application uh, because it has uh, some sort of electrolyte involved and electrolyte usually are ionic compounds or polar by nature and biological world also has a lot of uh, polar uh, kind of uh, you know the analytes are involved that's what uh, for biosensing or bioelectronics type of application uh, electrolyte gated and il organic electrochemical transistor are the preferable choices of the uh, kind of our devices and i mean in those devices says again uh, in case of uh, eg of it electrolyte gated one you create the double layer uh, along the electron, uh, electrolyte semiconductor interface whereas in case of uh, organic electrochemical uh, transistor the charge accumulation is uh, no longer limited to the interface uh, between the channel and electrolyte uh, only so here you can see that in case of uh, eg of it uh, you know the mobile ions are there and osc means organic semiconductor is not allowing those ions to go in because the organic semiconductor has a completely some sort of a more non polar backbone or alkyl chain whereas in oecp once you put start putting the uh, polar alkyl chain then you are trying to uh, kind of you know allowing mobile ions to go in and they are permeable and then you get some sort of a, a, you know ionic as well as a charge conductivity and that's what these biosensor type of devices they operate on a very low uh, voltage and this is the really one of the major requirement for uh, bioelectronics now uh, looking at the materials particularly uh, my background is more synthesis and we do a lot of exciting type of material so looking at this what is the exactly structural design motif we should think about for making the uh, high performance transistor usually electron donating and electron accepting don't accept to be combined we can really make the close pi pi stacking because of this donor acceptor interaction and that also overlaps the orbital and this don't acceptor uh, uh, kind of moiety in a backbone in a one polymer chain versus another one or might be a small molecular system they generates this uh, uh, kind of a, a very good pi pi stacking and pi pi stacking is uh, directly proportional i mean in a way uh, with a charge carrier mobility and high mobility is really critical and very important for this uh, technology to uh, kind of you know uh, to use it in various application uh, I, I mean and looking at this uh, particularly uh, uh, i mean don't accept her approach we can have a one dimensional donor acceptor as a, a kind of a donor based polymer they can be only hole transporting we can take a donor acceptor they can be low band gap ambipolar type of you can have a completely acceptor in the backbone end type and looking at the chart you can see among the various type of uh, materials have been involved uh, i mean have been evolved since 1985 Uh, and now onward uh, you can see the donor acceptor has really uh, took a quantum jump and now we are almost close to polycrystalline silicon regime and we are kind of achieving mobility stain or higher than 10 uh, looking at uh, my passion uh, to kind of work on the materials usually i took a dyes and pigments uh, which are very colorful materials i like to play with those color and and you might have noticed my background which is also having some fancy colors as a background so i i do work on a lot of these dyes and pigments and we do a lot of chemistry on that so looking at these dyes and pigments you can notice that there are wonderful colors so like uh, we can have a perylene or uh, thalocyanin or isoindigo which has been utilized for gene pants dyeing and all and then we have a diketopyrolopyrol this is a very famous dye and i have contributed on this particular dye a lot because uh, this dye first time we kind of uh, explored in 2019 when i was in singapore and we made a, a, a huge number of materials and published very heavily this ferrari dye which we called as a because uh, i mean i don't have a time to show you the serendipity uh, how this dpp dye was invented uh, by by siba specialty but this dye this type of a dye Uh, can be utilized as a coating material for ferrari car that's what the ferrari cars looks right you know and then you see the another uh, uh, kind of a compound which is uh, some sort of a anthranthrone dye which is orange color one and there are plenty of other type of uh, semiconductor so looking at the synthesis of this dye we can really make a, a very easy synthesis and i mean if you want to make this low cost printable inks of these uh, materials to make future electronics wearable or flexible we uh, we need to consider the synthesis cost as well as might be the high purity and uh, taking this uh, any aromatic carbonyl we can create this dpp dye and then we can do the bromination 
And once we get the brominated one, then we can really functionalize and then make a molecular material or polymer material. And looking at here, I mean, recently there is a nice review, uh, my student and we all uh, wrote that one. Uh, so uh, that has covered all important aspect of DPP based material for different type of application. If you can just read that one. Uh, I'd like to start, I mean, uh, showing you some of the DPP polymer, which we synthesized some time back, uh, taking the thiophene carbonitrile and then, I mean, making this one step synthesis, which is uh, like uh, the DPP core. And once we alkylate by branch alkyl chain, we can make a soluble uh, monomer and then uh, once we do the bromination after combining one with that boronic ester of benzothiazole we can make a polymer and that polymer it looks like i mean you can see from the slide uh, that the color of the polymer is a dark uh, black which is a low band gap typical identity of the polymer and then after that we can see the how morphology of this polymer looks like under various annealing condition and at particularly 180 degree annealing we get a very uh, a nice fibrillar morphology with interconnected structure and that has reflected the mobility value you can notice the whole and mobility value 0.35 and 0.40 centimeter square per voltage second and uh, looking, taking the same uh, dye, we also did some sort of a nano printing uh, type of things where we took up the uh, kind of a polymer, uh, DPP polymer, and then make the solution. And upon putting the PDMS stamp, we can make the nice aligned nano strips across source and drain. And just by doing this uh, kind of a process engineering, uh, we can really make the logic circuit or uh, where the two uh, transistor can be connected together. That is like a V in and V out. And that logic circuit as an inverter, uh, we measure that uh, how much gain we got. And you can notice that the gain value of this type of uh, logic circuit organic transistor base can give a very high value, uh, like uh, close to 60 or more. I mean, highest one was 105 for one of the devices. And then uh, looking at again, I mean, just by doing the process engineering, we got a very high uh, electron mobility. Earlier, we had a a mobility of you know 0.4 range but here three times increment like 1.45 so that clearly indicates that not only making materials or devices but also looking at this uh, kind of a nanomorphology or going on a nano level how we can make their uh, performance uh, kind of uh, elevation by doing process engineering uh, i'm going to tell you a few uh, uh, nice examples of various applications i showed you first the logic circuit second one we utilize this another uh, dpp polymer dye for sensing application and here is the mobility values uh, are given uh, like it shows whole and electron mobility as a dpp uh, low band gap ambipolar polymer and then we calculated pi pi stacking distance uh, and i mean we got all that important information but what exactly makes this type of polymer exciting for uh, kind of a sensing application upon exposing this organic transistor to the one of the very toxic uh, chemical called as xylene, uh, which is not good for human health. And there is a certain limitation of that. Uh, I mean, if you expose xylene to your human body, it has a adverse effect on cardiovascular or might be in, uh, on, on a, on a uh, uh, kind of a different types of, uh, I mean, uh, kind of, you know, adverse effect on even related with uh, some sort of a brains and all that. Uh, that type of thing. So uh, we need to, there is a no technology to identify the uh, lowest amount of xylene. And I think the National Institute of Health from United States, they mentioned that like 300 uh, ppm xylene, if you get exposed every day or whatever, then they may affect very badly to the body. So uh, I think the uh, we come up with this uh, transistor where we could identify only 40 ppm. And here you can see there is a lot of graphs. Uh, I mean, don't get confused. Those graphs are nothing but once we expose to the orthomet and para, xylene has a three uh, kind of uh, structures, you know, at the ortho position methyl group or meta position methyl or uh, para position methyl group. You know, this is how the just the changing the methyl group position as a structural isomer as analyte, we get still the very good uh, uh, sensitivity and detectivity for all each of this isomer, which is a very unique because you expose, you're not exposing only one type of xylene, you're exposing three subtype of xylene isomers and still you can identify which one gives what performance. And, and you can see this uh, change in a uh, performance, particularly mobility change, uh, that's what is a del ME, uh, uh, you know, uh, before and after exposure, then the del VTH means threshold voltage is changing. Threshold voltage is nothing but the once transistor starts operating, once you, kind of you know apply certain gate voltage and channel conductance get created then we can um, also uh, do some sort of a change in whole mobility since this is ambipolar polymer it shows whole and electron mobility that's what we got the two extra parameters and then we also got sub threshold swing 
you know whole and electron mobility regime so this this all uh, uh, kind of principal component analysis pca type of can can be done and then we can uh, get this data uh, using that one and here is uh, six sensing parameters which i mentioned to you they are obtained by using this uh, uh, dpp polymer as a as a uh, kind of you know semiconductor material uh, exposing to the xylene as analyte and uh, i mean we did some theoretical modeling and what exactly happens when xylene comes in you know, contact with a, a dpp polymer backbone then the energy level changes and we get a whole injection more favored because upon exposing xylene you can see homo value has moved up whereas lumo values uh, is also there so my, it means that the uh, holes are getting more injected and we could see that change in whole mobility then another type of polymer uh, which is where we put up the another condensed structure called as a naphthalene and this time uh, we can enhance the mobility up to 1 cm square per whole test second you can notice that in a backbone you have a thiopene uh, that uh, two nitrogen pyrrole pyrrole type of ring then thiopene and again two naphthalene so that clearly indicates that we have a lot of donor content there two thiopenes and one naphthalene and small uh, one acceptor content which is a dpp that dipyrrole pyrrole so by changing this uh, conjugated back we can really tune p type or n type in this case we are getting uh, a kind of a purely p type there is a slight uh, a kind of uh, electron uh, transport is happening if you see uh, carefully but once exposed to the atmosphere on all electron mobility disappears and we get purely p type then uh, we took another fused aromatic ring like a dithyno thiopene one to make fused a backbone aromatic backbone to push this mobility values high and as a chemist always uh, how i can make the a world's best material by combining my synthesis knowledge and how can i push this mobility value that is always uh, motivates me and in this case we could achieve mobility 4.2 uh, just by taking this uh, dithyanothiopene as another common or black uh, block sorry uh, then we do have a dpp furan uh, you know dpp can be created in a various flanking groups one could, uh, could utilize thiophene one can utilize uh, uh, furan or might be selenophene or pyridine i will explain you that uh, in next slides so these are the some sort of uh, all uh, dpp polymers which we have synthesized and we we published them in number of papers uh, and now uh, uh, when i moved to australia in qt i got this phd student man liu he did a fantastic job in terms of making another new uh, dpp type of material which i will share with you shortly so these are the kind of uh, dpp building blocks you see the flanking groups are changing from uh, thiopene furan uh, selenophene telerophene pyridine and dithyno i mean the uh, thiopene to the phenyl and thiazole and what nil did nil put Uh, put up the first time this aromatic ring called as a naphthalene and we make this naphthalene dpp this was our first report and this is a simple synthesis again take the naphthalene cyano uh, carbonyl as a starting material we get you um, know one step this compound alkylate it and then we can change this alkylation either you want a butyl octyl or shorter one and then we compared with other uh, dpp analogs with a thiopene flank and furan flank and then uh, we can see that like, upon putting the naphthalene we enhance the thermal stability better crystallinity or energy level also we tune and then it also enhances the molecular packing because of the acins are having a fused aromatic backbone and that is the reason we also tune the alkyl chain going from desyl dodesyl and hexadesyl and the, he, here is the color of this dye how it changes interestingly if you notice that in a liquid state the color is same in solid state colors are different we also puzzled what is happening and this is might be purely based on the solid state interaction Uh, and currently we are looking much in a detail so taking this dye this is just a small monomer we didn't do any fancy kind of polymer or uh, other synthesis since there are some limitations to synthesize a polymer just but we thought let us take this only small monomer and still we got pretty good mobility uh, you know upon annealing at 100 degrees celsius which is uh, 10 to minus 2 for monomer is very impressive and uh, like also uh, by using different alkyl chain uh, you can notice that this mobility is slightly improved further uh, higher number to now um, 0.019 and here you can see with respect to the alkyl chain how this crystallinity or the polarized microscope image shows how the texture of this uh, small molecule looks like
And we got the cover picture because since it was a new dye and then it was highlighted on Newton of chemistry cover picture. Now Neil started to grow the single crystal. I was also interested if we can grow the single crystals because usually with small molecule, it is easy to grow the crystal, but it is uh, hard uh, with, with the polymer. I mean, it is uh, polydispersed uh, different polymer backbone compound. And upon uh, utilizing the single crystal, uh, I mean, these are the just again the, uh, in this case, he just put doctyl and hexyl alkyl chain. Uh, and then just taking this two halkyl chain thin film uh, transistor, we still got mobility same like ten to minus two. Nothing much uh, uh, kind of uh, fascinating here. But the fascination comes here. Once we grow the same molecule as a single crystal, and we measure the single crystal mobility, values are uh, looking in a ten to minus one range, which is very good. I mean, and then the usually single crystal is highly crystalline domain, and that's what charge carriers get easily hop uh, from from this and domains and that's what the mobility uh, we get very high and uh, we did uh, this molecule I mean we got a single crystal data and then we kind of uh, check like uh, what is going on between hexyl and octyl so in case of octyl the pi stacking is more uh, clear and that is the reason why we got uh, octyl actually this work has been submitted to naturecom because the same material we utilize it for other two application uh, because of time I'm not explaining OLED and uh, perovskite data here uh, but I'll show you some of the other type of polymer which recently we uh, published uh, like a pyridine based DPP with the selenophene as a co-monomer, uh, where we, in this case, uh, pyridine is a N-type, um, uh, very uh, kind of a rich uh, N-type material, and then taking selenophene as a donor, we got this polymer. And then uh, using this uh, donor acceptor polymer, in collaboration with Japan, uh, we got the mobility uh, highest one 2.22 uh, electron mobility, uh, which is which is very impressive. Uh, this one is uh, just published in advanced function material, and then you can notice that uh, it also shows the uh, whole mobility. Uh, it is basically ambipolar material, but the electron mobility much more pronounced because of the backbone having the pyridine as a flanking group. Uh, and then the whole system because becomes more entire parable because also related with might be the LUMO value. And here is the uh, DAC curve. We usually we check out the thermal properties of these materials correlating that with the annealing conditions and all because uh, this polymer chains, usually they get uh, some sort of organized once you start uh, hitting them uh, and the thickness uh, of this polymer we are taking here in the range of 40 nanometer or 50 nanometer, let us see. So if it start, uh, uh, annealing them, then the polymer backbone try to get more organized and then we get diff different crystallity. So in this case, 240, we got the uh, kind of a higher surface roughness and that is the reason why this uh, material shows a very high mobility at 240. Because if you have more uh, big crystallites in a, a, a kind of in, in your morphology, it means that charges can easily uh, get hop. Uh, if you get like some sort of a lot of defects or might be a uh, amorphous nature, then the charges get lost, and then we get a very lousy mobility. That is the reason, and this is published. The another uh, work where we took up the three different type of DPP flanking group. You can notice them in a colored, uh, the blue colored, which is like a furan one and selenophene one, and then the pyridine one. Uh, just we change the flanking group, and rest of the other co-monomer we have a same. And the reason of selection of this. Uh, Flor, flu, uh, I mean, uh, fluorine substituted by thiopine is because they have some sort of a, uh, you know, the, the interaction between sulfur and uh, fluorine, and this, that is the reason. And then we wanted to see what is going on with this type of molecular structure. So the synthesis is given here because of the time. I'll just skip this one. Uh, but again, taking the similar like uh, OT uh, DS uh, type of uh, SAM treatment, three milligram per ml as a, so, as a concentration of this, and then making this transistor. This is in collaboration with again uh, Mishinobu San in Japan. And then we also calculated the energy level because every material we synthesize, we usually check out the energy levels. I mean, uh, P type, N type, ambipolar, this energy level is important uh, kind of a, a property because whether holes are getting injected or electron getting injected based on their energy level. Uh, th that is absolutely important. So we got the HOMO value, uh, despite this is an N-type material and sometimes N-type material, uh, getting the LUMO value by CV is a little bit uh, complicated. So we first determined the HOMO value by PESA, photoelectron spectroscopy in air, and then we calculated the difference between uh, HOMO and optical band gap. And this is how we got the LUMO. So LUMO, you can clearly see in case of a pyridine-based uh, polymer, which is giving a minus 4.06, which is very good LUMO value for electron injection. And just you change a different flanking group, uh, like, I mean, uh, either you take might be some sort of a furon or might be selenophene, you can see how the LUMOs are changing slightly. And you also notice the HOMO. 
uh, homo uh, really goes very low and that is the best sign uh, to get a highly stable devices and this is uh, this particular poly uh, these three polymers we tested in a two different condition some uh, some of the devices tested inside the glow box and some of them in the air so in air they shows a very typical p type for transistor behavior and only whole mobility we can notice whereas uh, uh, whereas uh, we can uh, kind of uh, 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 raja how many minutes should i stop now or hello raja sorry your your time ended at uh, 10:30 okay yeah. Okay, okay. So I'll just uh, continue my session then. It's, you, you, okay. you have you have five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, looking at the uh, looking at these uh, mobility values, uh, I mean we got uh, really the 0.95 as uh, in air. But upon putting the same polymer in a vacuum, uh, we could see that it shows uh, P type as well as N type. It means that in a p type but in uh, vacuum they shows a uh, ambipolar so uh, uh, this is like i mean this is very uh, kind of uh, uh, obvious because n type mobility usually in air gets affected because of the air, air oxygen and mo moisture and uh, we could see this how this p type and n type behavior changes the mobility uh, some of the material they only show only the whole mobility in air and they show only electron mobility in vacuum uh, and some of them show the both combination then we also made uh, some other uh, type of uh, polymer where uh, they could be useful for electrochemical transistor applications and all that so ethylene oxy uh, oxide chains we have utilized here as a, uh, as a as a side alkyl chain i think because of time i will just skip this one uh, because i think i need to show you might be some of the last uh, couple of slides important one and then then i'll all done with my uh, talk uh, so uh, i think uh, uh, i think the uh, what i wanted to give you a message uh, to, to all of all the, the scientific community and student as well so electro i mean the transistors that could be either uh, organic field effector or organic electrochemical transistors or might be a kind of electrolyte uh, gated transistor uh, is a very important technology and uh, recently uh, we published this chemical society review where we are talking about how this transistor technology could be useful for uh, various uh, applications including uh, variable sensor platforms and all and in bioelectronics like people are trying to uh, make this electronic uh, transistor based uh, patches uh, putting up on a brain uh, measuring the brain's activity those people have uh, schizophrenia and other type of brain diseases they can be monitored by seeing the brain action versus transistor performance i mean uh, uh, as a bio interface and i mean this technology has a huge uh, potential including uh, like you know the biodegradable electronics and all uh, with this i think i would like to uh, thanks to uh, research group uh, most of the work today i showed you that has been done by kwian liu uh, he is almost finished his phd now and uh, really i'm thankful to the all collaborators uh, mission obusan and uh, taketa san from from japan uh, sergey did like molecular modeling and uh, um, my group members as well as uh, uh, our organic electronic uh, device fabrication uh, uh, people and and really thanks to the australian research council for giving me this uh, future fellowship funding and uh, just wanted to tell you that uh, you know i mean an editorial board if you are keen to uh, kind of publish some papers in flexible imprinted electronics i'm happy to receive the papers and and thanks for your kind attention thank you dr prasan for your talk on conjugated materials and evaluation for organic field of transistor it was a really wonderful talk and uh, we have got couple of questions from the participants so yeah most of the questions are based on the stability of the polymer materials can you just mm. shed some light on the stability yeah uh, actually it is a very uh, well captured point uh, most of the polymers i mean this uh, stability is one of the bottleneck uh, for organic electronics community to bring this uh, products in the market and i mean i like to share with you oled has also similar problem initially when oled was discovered in 1990 and i mean you know the device was just fraction of second it worked and then later on it died and then it took like 10 15 years to uh, kind of mature the technology and today we can see oled tvs are there in the market 
so in case of a transistor uh, looking at that uh, kind of you know the uh, you know making highly stable material for practical application is absolutely important and critical and uh, that can be done that is possible most of the uh, dpp polymer if we have uh, this energy level values are uh, pretty uh, all right uh, i mean uh, you know they can show very high uh, stability particularly if our homo values are uh, like you know 5.4 or 5.5 more towards that region they are absolutely uh, stable i mean we have fabricated some materials um, i mean devices using some of the materials which are 10 uh, 5 years old still we can see the mobility values are similar uh, range uh, n type having the mobility in air is a critical uh, challenge but it can be also done if we take a extremely strong electron withdrawing group in a backbone and uh, we can make this lumo value like might be 4.3 or 4.4 electron volt you can get a very stable n type uh, mobility as well so this is the whole game is uh, based on the energy levels uh, and I mean, again, the purity of your material. Uh, I think if there is a little bit of impure uh, kind of, you know, uh, component in that can be oxidized and that can uh, spoil the whole game and it can give us a lousy mobilities and all. Thank you. Another question is about the toxicity of our is Are these devices environmentally compatible? Uh, in terms of the, yeah, I think uh, that is what like uh, we also look at uh, some of the approaches called as a green electronics or where we can have uh, materials, they can be kind of uh, uh, taken from the nature. And I think uh, this nature inspired organic semiconductor is one of the really important research area. And you notice that some of the dye or pigments which we have taken, uh, they, they can be really derived from nature. Like, I mean, iso indigo can be extracted Indigo can be extracted from the plant, and uh, some of the other semiconductors, uh, you know, uh, they uh, they they are basically available in the nature, so they are uh, can be easy source uh, sourceable. And depending on, I mean, yeah, uh, in terms of like what you we are putting in a backbone, uh, I know, I mean, sulfur and all those or silnofin type of backbones are there. But uh, until and unless uh, these materials we are using in ambient condition and not really kind of uh, you know using in a very hot uh, like more than 100 where the polymer starts, uh, I mean, maybe degrading, but most of these materials are very stable uh, with respect to the uh, ambient condition. Yeah, I think they are, they, are, uh, they, they should be uh, fine. I mean, they can be, they can be easily usable. Like P.PSS has been, people are trying to make the electrochemical transistor for uh, various bioelectronics applications. And I mean, uh, uh, still, I mean, uh, they did some work on a toxicity and biological assay. And I think the initial results are uh, very promising. And I, I don't find, I mean, uh, definitely we need to take an into an account what type of application we are using. Like if you want to utilize it, really implantable type of devices and all, we need to take this biological assay of each of these materials is absolutely uh, important. I mean, very well uh, asked question, uh, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one more last question. Yeah. To the lifetime of organic field, I mean field emitting transistor and device based on that uh, is better than the conventional semiconductor devices. And uh, one follow up question, what is the temperature range they can be operated? So sorry, the first question is about the uh, performance. It is, it is better than the conventional semiconductor devices. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think the conventional semiconductors, I mean, there is a three types of the materials currently uh, state of the art material people are utilizing but if you see i mean uh, lg or samsung uh, oled tvs those are currently getting uh, kind of uh, you know the operated by using transistors which are made up of uh, inorganic oxides because the nature of inorganic oxide they are a bit robust uh, compared to the organic one but uh, some of the highly stable organic transistors are also there and that's what might be LG have moved towards the flexible uh, now the mobile phone. So for the all this flexibility of aspect, I think the important uh, part is like, I mean, the performance and kind of run these devices. So I think in terms of the looking organic semiconductor performance wise, they are reaching close to the polycrystalline silicon. And now the highest mobility numbers are in a ranges of uh, 20, 30s. Even I noticed that one of the Zenan Bao's papers, she has reported mobility close to 40. So I think uh, like the chemist or chemi uh, chemistry community, if they come up with a new fancy building blocks, if uh, they make a high molecular weight, nice polymer, which is a highly crystalline, uh, and if we do the energy level, 
uh, modulation and all and do the proper device engineering, uh, I think getting the very highly stable, very high performance metal and replacing uh, even some of this uh, currently existing, uh, you know, the silicon and other type of inorganic is, is possible. And that, that is what like, you know, the, uh, I mean, all the organic electronic community people are trying to push this. But I mean, this is not an easy job. It, it takes a time, as I mentioned to you for OLED TV, how long it took to, uh, you know, from concept to the, uh, you know, market product. So, but this is a continuous uh, kind of, you know, evolution of a science and that's what uh, you know, we academics or you young students uh, should come up with uh, like fancy ideas or nice ideas and how we can uh, kind of, you know, uh, solve this problem. But I mean, it is definitely looks extremely positive, uh, the way the reports are coming up and the way our technology moving forward. So thank you, Dr. Prasant, for your clarification. Yeah. So, uh, Thank you, Dr. Prashant, once again, uh, on behalf of our center, VAT, uh, for accepting our invitation. It was indeed a great lecture, and uh, many part there were many participants who are enjoying your lectures. Thank you. Once again. Thank you very much uh, for VAT, for organizing this and uh, interacting virtually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we'll meet again in uh, one another event like this. Yeah, sure, sure. Absolutely. All the best. Good luck for remaining uh, yeah. and uh, talks. Yeah. We'll, we'll catch thank up. You, thank you. Have a great day. Dear participants, we are collecting the attendance report through Zoom software, so you do not worry about the attendance and all. Thank you.